America is filled with buildings. We have manipulated and covered over the land with vast roadways and concrete cities. It wasn't always this way. Early pioneers were astonished by the natural beauty they encountered, and the strange places and landforms. But there are still parts of this country where the past wasn't completely covered over. Early settlers came across bizarre stoneworks as they entered the primeval North American forest. And for years, Los Angeles construction crews have whispered of strange tunnels under the downtown region. Occasionally, the past gives up its secrets to those who can see beyond the present. For scattered among the hills and byways of ancient America are the remnants of a past world, whose origins are unknown and whose builders left massive stoneworks tucked away in the forest. Some appear to be solar temples from a long gone religion, while others are a vast complex of underground tunnels that snake through the ground with no apparent purpose. Near an 18th century cemetery in the middle of Massachusetts is one of the strangest tunnels yet uncovered. Looking like a simple colonial field well, it turns out to be much more bizarre. Buried below 16 feet of very hard clay is an intriguing complex of stonework whose origins are shrouded in mystery. Near the bottom of the shaft, Two stone-lined tunnels wander through the underground hillside. One runs north for about 16 feet, while the other runs for about 68 feet before it collapses. After months of excavation, the bottom layer of tunnel rocks exposed a strange stone disk that dates to around 5,000 years ago. Who were the builders of this tunnel? The underground chambers and the stone passageways found across ancient America? No one knows. For thousands of years, America was home to an ancient civilization that built gigantic earthen mounds. Some were for show, others were for ceremonial purposes, and a few appeared to be defensive forts constructed high above ridgetops. In the 1870s, a team of workers sanctioned by Congress spent years plundering these mounds, searching for the true identity of the builders. At the completion of their digs, they determined that many of the mounds were burials. Several government volumes were published. Armed with these 19th century maps, a colleague and I flew along the northern coast of Massachusetts when we spotted something in the swamp grass. There was a circular clearing in the pine forest as if something refused to grow in this spot. On a spit of land near the Merrimack River, we found the raised earthen mound just barely visible. My colleague, Jim Whittle and I spent the next decade systematically excavating this strange site. Dozens of skeletons were unearthed. It was a sacred place for the dead. One moonlit night, Jim visited the mound and felt compelled to walk near the water. He later said that there was something odd nearby, a, a vibration of a sort. Days later, our digging revealed that a young woman was buried in the sand over 8,000 years ago. She had been speaking to Jim. Her hands were placed in front of her face while her legs were flexed. Her body was sprinkled with a powder called red ochre, and many fishnet knitting stones were found with her. This sacred mound was used by hundreds of people for thousands of years who lived, laughed, and loved within sight and smell of a giving ocean. One can only dream of the ceremonies rituals and stories that took place here so very long ago.
everybody, South Trento again, New Mexico. Next stop is the Rio Grande Gorge. We're gonna be taking a look at this incredible gorge that's a little bit north of Taos and some of the peculiarities that are associated with it, like the famous Taos Hum. Over the years, people in Taos have complained about a sound coming uh, late at night. It almost sounds like a delivery truck or generator running. It's called the Taos Hum. And that particular sound that uh, they hear up here seems to be something that a lot of people have heard. And if you haven't heard, it sounds just like a, a goof or people making a mistake. Well, my suspicion is that it has something to do with tectonic forces. Because right here at the, the Rio Grande Bridge, you have two continental plates that are separated, that have been separated for millions and upon millions of years. So there's a lot of activity underneath the ground, plus in the area there's a lot of volcanoes. So it's possible that this hum or sound that some people hear might be the result of uh, rocks under the ground just moving and shifting, and some people are more sensitive than others. I actually have heard it, and it does in fact sound like a generator off in the distance. This is an amazing gorge, absolutely amazing. You can see how the crust has been separated. This is really two continental plates that have separated millions of years ago. This is Point Doom in Southern California, a little bit north of Malibu. It's a large promontory of land that juts out into the Pacific Ocean. What's unique about this spot? Turns out the ancient Kumash Native Americans would come here and practice their spiritual ceremonies. Right in this one area, this is where it all happened. This was the, the, the locus of very intense spiritual communication with the gods, uh, the, the, the spirit world as it were. About 1945 or so, this land became uh, the property of a developer and he started uh, platting it for little uh, salt box homes at the time. This went on for quite a number of years until uh, the 1960s when very large mansions were built and occupied by many Hollywood celebrities. As with all my videos, the question is, why here? Why do they come out here to practice their ceremonies? Now, there's no, no question about it. This is a gorgeous spot. If you're going to do something with the spiritual world, this is it. Catalina Island can also be seen from this promontory. And many of the Kumash would canoe out to that spot looking for stone bowls, which the Catalina Islanders were noted for. They would trade fish, icons, and so forth. During gardening season every year, many gardeners have found evidence of the Kumash being here. Again, stone bowls, axes, pestles, and these curious stone effigies. Little whales, or little seals, pipes, made into a particular format that is quite unique to the particular people that lived here at one time. But this is Point Doom, a beautiful location that has a lot of intrigue and mystery still within the ground itself. It would be well worth your while to come out on here and, and trek around a bit and just take some time to just explore. Remember, if you find anything, leave it in place. Never pick up anything, never take it home. It's not your property, it's the property of the ancients. This is Malibu Lagoon, where Malibu Creek 
coming from the mountains meets the Pacific Ocean. Now this particular spot is incredibly interesting because when the first Spaniards got to this area, hundreds of canoes came out of this lagoon and met the Spanish ships. In fact, it was called the Village of Canoes, there were so many. Right where the Pacific Coast Highway Bridge crosses over the, the Malibu Creek is where a vast settlement of Kumash Native Americans lived. And they all came out here in their canoes, past the breakers, and they met the Spaniards. And the Spaniards were absolutely overwhelmed by the number of canoes that came out to meet them. To this day, this lagoon has a lot of birds, a lot of fish, clamshells, mussels. It has a lot of stuff that people need to survive. Consequently, there was a vast village, as I mentioned just prior, and if you poke around the area, which unfortunately is not possible unless you have a guide with you, you can actually find remnants of this canoe village, as was called by the Spaniards. The pull that these places had on the early Kumash and other Native American tribes was very simple. It's a spectacularly gorgeous place, but even more so back then, there was food, there was fish, fowl, there was water, plenty of berries, plenty of nuts, acorns are all over the place. You tend to find a certain type of stone mortar, a deep recessed bowl that they would pound the acorns into a, a gruel, leach out the tannic acids, and use them for everything, high protein. So living out here was extraordinarily easy. Make no mistake about it, Southern California is a beautiful place to live. The scenery is incredible, the wind is balmy, the weather isn't as great, maybe two, three weeks of rain. Now, if you can deal with the forest fires and if you can deal with the mudslides, it's a gorgeous place to live. Oh yeah, earthquakes as well. It's a wonderful place to be. And the Kumash Native Americans found that to be the case. Unfortunately today, there is a lot of traffic. In fact, so much traffic that sometimes visitors coming out here say, forget this place, I never want to come back. I, I know the feeling. I lived out here for many, many years and then have been coming back periodically. And I always forget the beach traffic on the weekends, uh, the early commute traffic. Again, what was kind of interesting is that in the 1920s, there was an entire episode of advertising from New York and the East Coast asking people to come out here to grow oranges, to grow avocados. And slowly but surely they did. And it slowly but surely transformed this place into the megalopolis that it is today. The early advertising situation worked extraordinarily well. Again, it's hard to reconcile the moder modernity that you have in Southern California with the people that once lived here in apparently a very peaceful existence. There's never been any uh, indication that the Kumash were warriors. They were not attacked by anyone. They just kind of were mellow and lived in the... Uh, in the surf zone, they lived uh, up the river a bit, up the creek. They had a very peaceful existence, which is something that uh, one wishes one can go back to and see how they managed to do this. This is Sal Trento signing off from the Village of the Canoes at the end of Malibu Creek, where it dumps into the Pacific Ocean. Until next time, take care. My background is in pure science. I observe, examine, touch, and experiment. But sometimes I come across places that stretch the imagination, that defy measurement, places that almost scoff at any attempt to explain them. I recently asked my good friend Maria, who traveled the world looking for exotic places, to join me in Salem, Massachusetts, to examine the sites where many people were executed after the 17th century witch trials. I asked Maria to contact anyone who perhaps was more in tune with any lingering ancient feelings, with any so-called residual emotional artifacts of a tragic place. I thought it would make for a funny episode to offset my serious side. I never anticipated what happened. Maria invited Lisa Ann, a woman who claimed she had a gift for seeing alternate realities. 
Lisa Ann had no idea where she specifically was going and what to expect. There were no signs, no banners, or historical markers anywhere. We were just going for a walk in the woods and up an unremarkable hill. Our only request, tell us what you feel, if anything. There was no prep, no background info, just a walk in the woods. We're on location and we're about to go in. Lisa knows nothing of these sites. She's gonna go in ahead of us and we're gonna record her first impressions. I just feel very sad as I'm starting to walk up here. I feel like I can't breathe once I hit right here. It's just a really heavy sadness. And I just feel like there's a lot of people like watching or something like lined up. It's just this whole, like I just feel like these, the way these rocks are, this is just like a gateway. And there's just a lot of heaviness and sadness right here. There's a woman that's like sitting on the rock over there and she says, she keeps talking about eight and 13 and I don't know really what that means, but she said that people were put to death here and she's like kind of watching over the property, almost like doing a blessing on it to like cleanse it. And she's um, probably like in her 30s. She's, I mean, she would have been considered Wiccan, but she's more really was like an herbalist or something. And she just sits and she watches over this. This, when I stand here, I just can't breathe, like at all. Like, I just have a heaviness in my chest. And I feel, it's weird, because I feel this anxiety of like, but then I'm okay with it. As you walk up here, you just, it's very sad because I know that there's nothing that I can do. Like once I get here, it's just hopeless. And there's an older woman here and she just keeps saying like, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. I just keep seeing um, different people died on this. So like there's more than one. So do you know where we are? I really don't, but obviously we're in Boston, so yeah. I'm thinking this has something to do with witches. Yeah, we're just north of there. We're, um, we're actually in Danvers now, and this is Witch Rock. Oh. And um, so what you were picking up, picking up on was actually pretty interesting. And um, we are on the land of what used to belong to John Proctor, and he was the first man who was accused of witchcraft back around the time of the witch trials. And um, this is a very interesting place because these rocks at the right time of day, at the right time of light, people say that there could be symbols seen on these rocks. And um, those symbols could be dated back to the time of the witch trials. But the curious thing is there's lots of mystery around John Proctor and what he did and who he was and why was he wandering out in dark in the middle of the night. Where there was a lot of sadness in the other place, there's a lot of anger here. I feel very, very angry. And I just, I keep hearing like people crying and there's a woman crying and she's just saying like, this is not gonna change anything. It's not gonna change anything. The sad thing is I keep seeing um, children, like smaller children, there's like a little girl over there. And I feel like they're brought here to watch punishment so that they don't act bad or they don't act out. It's like a lesson, like I'm going to teach you a lesson. And there's like a little girl who's maybe five years old that's there just crying. And I feel a lot of energy right here. Like as I'm walking around, there's just sadness, 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 but right in the spot, it's almost like you feel this, I don't know, I know it sounds crazy, but like this vibration through your body or something if you just stand right here. You know what's really interesting? The place that we were at before, there was such a heaviness, uh, sadness, mm -hmm. and a sense of like this is all because of fear. Yeah. This has a completely different energy. Right. There is such an anger here, mm -hmm. and I, I want to use the word like disgust. Like I'm just disgusted. 
disgusted. At the end of the trials, the, uh, the accused were brought here in carts, large carts. They were thrown in them with their hands bound. And they came down Hanson Street with the crowd following and brought up what used to be cart paths across that baseball field and then up through the, through the woods, what is now woods here. And they were brought to this place, put on the gallows. Their bodies were not buried. There was no kind of ceremony of any kind. They were simply tossed. They were tossed down in these ravines here, these crevices, and they were left. This is Gallows Hill in Salem. And the horror that happened here has not been forgotten. Welcome to the Kumash Painted Cave in Santa Barbara. High up in the Santa Ines Mountains above Santa Barbara, there is this incredible cave that has the most delightful images within it. Now apparently shamans would come here and draw them. The suspicion is that they hallucinated using various uh, psychotropic drugs. This actually is a state park and uh, they uh, ironed, they gated the, the cave a number of years ago uh, to prevent people from going in there and messing them up. But there are dozens of these on private land all around these mountains. It's an easy climb to the cave. There are some uh, well-built stairs, but getting here from Santa Barbara is a bit tricky. Winding road goes uh, back and forth to the very top of the peak. You can see some graffiti from the 1950s and 60s on the rock there. Again, there are dozens of these caves in the mountains, some quite nearby, but on private land. I've had the opportunity over the years to see them. There is that little figure, that little person with the hat on. Very strange, strange thing. The circles with the spokes and the polychrome, reds and blacks and whites, very common in Kumash drawings. These holes that you see are possibly just the eroded sandstone. They are interesting though, they seem to be quite regular. So the obvious question is, what's the deal with this cave? Well, it's somewhat isolated. It takes about uh, 20 minutes from Santa Barbara, sometimes a half hour, to go up the little tiny trail roads. Uh, single, uh, single lane asphalt when you get closer and closer to Painted Cave Road. So in the past, it must have taken quite a long time to trek up from the coast. All right, what's the deal? Well, it turns out that the Kumash were intimately involved with the spiritual realm. And apparently some of their shamans had a close connection with the spiritual ethereal world. The suspicion is that these people would come up to these caves, hang out here for days, probably fast, as I mentioned before, take some hallucinogenic drugs of some type, some psychotropic plants and so forth, and draw images. Some of these images look like the images that uh, we have from uh, the 1960s, 70s, uh, hallucinogenic trials where they would have patients take LSD and so forth before it became illegal and draw what they saw. These images seem to be beyond the, uh, the realm of the real world. It's, it's a world that gets into the spiritual realm and it's possible that these people were trying to commune with their ancestors. Perhaps they were looking for um, uh, safe passage over the channel, go into the, the water, uh, to the Channel Islands for fishing. Perhaps they were just trying to get a, a feel for what was happening in their life. 
But apparently, based upon the size of these, these caver this cave and the other caves, it's possible that maybe one, maybe two people at the most hung out here. As with many mysterious sites that I've explored around the world, sometimes it's worthwhile to go beyond the actual site into the surrounding terrain to see what still exists off the beaten track, as it were. At one time, the stream was a very powerful waterway. You can see by the shaped rocks, the rounded structures, and so forth. And every so often when it rains a lot in California, this picks up. This clearly was the water source for the people or for the person who lived up in that cave and painted those strange images. The Painted Cave, high above Santa Barbara in the Santa Ynez Mountains. A wonderful, wonderful place to visit. This is Sal Trento, signing off from Mysterious Places. The discovery of ancient writing in America has been marred by forgeries professional tirades, blind ambition, cover-ups, and academic tiptoeing. Hundreds of tablets have been reported since colonial days, but most were simply ignored. In recent years, archaeologists have dismissed the markings, saying they were the eroded stone, scratches from field plows, Indian tally marks, or outright forgeries. But, as the late seminicist Dr. Cyrus Gordon once remarked, to doubt the authenticity of all New World inscriptions, it has become necessary to demonstrate a conspiracy plot stretching from 1872 to modern times, with a ring of pranksters operating in Brazil, Minnesota, Maine, and Europe. Have there ever been any ancient inscriptions dug up at an archaeological site? Well, yes. Back in the late 1800s, the U.S. Congress authorized Cyrus Thomas to poke around America, looking to see who built the vast earthen mounds found throughout the country. True to his mission, Thomas dug up a burial mound at Back Creek, Tennessee, finding bones, tools, and an inscribed stone lying underneath a skeleton's head. Thomas interpreted the marks as letters of the newly formed Cherokee Native American alphabet. That is, until 70 years later, scholar Henrietta Merce pointed out that Thomas had published an image of the stone upside down. Turning it around, the marks were actually ancient Hebrew used in the Middle East around 100 AD. At Grave Creek, West Virginia in 1838, Another inscribed tablet was found at the bottom of a 60-foot mound. Henry Schoolcraft, a distinguished 19th century historian, mentioned it in his major work on the American Indian. This curious relic appears to reveal, in the unknown past, evidence of ancient European intrusion into the continent. The reason for this cultural amnesia is simple. Very few American researchers study ancient languages and script-like images have often been overlooked, focusing instead on bones, stones, and pottery. 
In fact, this bias has precluded even the understanding of the spiritual reality of Native American images. My teams have searched the hills, valleys, and canyons of ancient America and have located many rock walls filled with mysterious markings. We've contacted local farmers, ranchers, and desert dwellers who have found other unusual slabs of rock with strange writing. Just beyond these trees is one of the strangest rocks in America with strange symbols, markings, things that people have no idea what they mean. We're gonna take a look. It's called Judicola Rock. This one large rock has a dazzling maze of over 150 designs and symbols. An enormous amount of work went into these carvings. The little work that's been done thus far indicates that the symbols date back to at least 5,000 years ago. And no one has a clue as to what they all mean. The rock is part of a large ancient quarry site that once existed throughout this region. The native Cherokee nation claims no responsibility for the carvings, though their oral tradition attempts to explain it. Their story, Tusala was a great slant-eyed giant who ruled the weather, the wind, mountains, rain, thunder, and lightning. According to legend, the great giant once leaped over a mountain and landed here on impact, scratching the rock that we see today. As usual with ancient inscriptions and rock sites that I've traveled through throughout the world, and those of you that have watched the video, previous videos have seen, it's the surrounding area that's sometimes even more important. Now in the last several years, the local community has put up uh, barriers and uh, a little walkway and so forth to sort of take a look at this rock. And I came out here many years ago, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and started wandering around the community and looking for the ancient quarry site. And in fact, you can actually still find evidence of the quarry site. This is called soapstone. It's a very soft stone that was used by the Cherokee Nation, among other Native American groups, to build, to carve pipes and other types of uh, phenomena like that. What's intriguing, though, is that this large stone has been here for a very long time. Now, not surprisingly, there is water nearby. In fact, there's a beautiful rushing stream about 20 yards from here, and we'll take a little walk to that site. Now you don't have a lot of quarry workers hanging around a site without any source of water. And this is the source. It's maybe about 10 yards from the rock. The problem with inscribed stones is that they're from another era, another time period. And no one's around to ask them what the symbols mean. So we have to infer many, many things about rocks that have markings on them. As you've seen in this video, there are a series of inscriptions that have been found throughout the entire United States. Presently in Western North Carolina, there's this one rock that we've been looking at, and it's a doozy. No one has a clue what the symbols mean, what the oral tradition of the Cherokee has to do with this rock, but again, we do know that it's very, very old. In America, there are mysterious markings on rocks that may tell a story spanning millennia. The issue is, what do the markings say? And whose story is it? Hey everybody, South Trento here, down in New Mexico, about uh, 40 miles north of Santa Fe. Today we're gonna be visiting a place called Sankawi. It's an incredibly intriguing site of cliff dwellings, of petroglyphs, and of these strange, strange grooves that surround part of the entranceway. Not really sure what they are. Local archaeologists say that they are the result of lots of people walking through a very soft type of volcanic stone. I'm not too sure of that. 
In any event, we're going to be heading out uh, right now to take a look at this bizarre and frankly um, very little populated area. Very few people come visit this site. Highly recommend it. Psychoe. What are these pathways that lead up into the main living area of the Sankwe? I've spent a lot of time here, I've looked at these things, I've looked at the water flow, and yes, sometimes the water flow has created even more depth, but there's a lot of other places for this to happen that hasn't. When you follow this path up, you're led to one particular spot, and that's Petroglyphs. These are markings on stone that the people that lived here, for some reason, felt that the very top of this area, the top of this ridge top, was a place to put things like Cocopelli, Coca uh, things like water signs, snake signs, and so forth. This looks like a processional pathway that leads directly to the Petroglyphs. Now, how mysterious is that? We're going to head up to where the petroglyphs are, the etchings on stone, and take a look at each one to see what in the world was going on here several hundred years ago. at Sunkwe spent a lot of time carving images into stone. As I mentioned before, some things we understand, like a swirl we think is water, but then this, this ever-present figure of uh, with raised hands or downturned hands, we don't really understand what that is. There is one, though, that we do understand, and that's Cocapelli. It's essentially a figure playing a flute who has either a hunchback or a quiver of arrows. But you find this particular motif all over the Southwest in a range covering several thousand miles, actually. So the question is, who was Cocopelli? Well, he was in the modern Pueblo mythology. He was a, a, um, a mythical figure who was involved with fertility and healing. It's possible he was an itinerant traveler who went from Pueblo to Pueblo Rock shelter, rock shelter, giving out information, helping people to keep track of what was going on. But it is an iconic figure that you tend to see. Again, here you can see the head of Cocopelli and the flute and the body etched in stone. Sankwe is like looking at a sun-bleached skeleton. It's up to us to put some flush on it to make it whole again. Hey everybody, Sal Trento here. On the way to the Sanctuario de Chimayo via the High Road to Taos. This is a bleak, mysterious, forbidding area that we're traveling on right now. We're off to a place called Chimayo. Chimayo is a fascinating place. It was a, set up as a sanctuary or a church back in the 1800s. But for thousands of years, the Tiwa Native Americans, the people that lived up in the Puye area, the Sankwe and so forth, were traveling there to take the mud, to put it on their bodies for healing purposes. Remember, it's a holy Catholic site. A lot of people hold this place as extraordinarily dear. To their faith. Again, the interesting thing about this is that it was here well before the Catholic Church that was put up in the 1800s. But again, people come here for a lot of reasons. Many of them have to do with health. So please be respectful of these people, but understand that this place is much, much older than the 1800s, if not thousands of years.
When I first visited the Sanctuario a number of years ago, I was in the main altar area, and I saw a well-dressed couple come in holding a baby. But off to the side of the baby was an oxygen tank. The couple came in, they knelt, they made the sign of the cross, and then they went to the antechamber where the mud is. I followed them in because I was kind of curious. Looking from the outside, I saw them put mud all over the chest of this little baby, no more than four months old. And then they wept and they cried. And then they walked out and I had to know. So I approached them and said, I'm so sorry. Tell me what you were doing. They looked at me, they looked at the baby and they said, we've exhausted all medical possibilities. This is our last hope. We pray that something good will happen. That's a powerful emotion. And I saw that. People have been doing this for thousands of years. Now this is a weird place. I'm at Cheeseman Park in Denver, Colorado. At first glance, it looks like a rather mundane, unremarkable park where you hang out and get suntan, ride around those uh, omnipresent scooters in every city in the country. But for thousands of years, below the soil was an ancient Native American Arapaho burial ground. Then in the early 1870s, when Denver was becoming much more than a gold supply station, the land was sold to the city for a city cemetery. The area around the city cemetery was the go-to place for a lot of very wealthy people to build these giant mansions, which had spectacular views of the Rocky Mountains with the snow-capped peaks and so forth. But in a few years, the cemetery became overgrown and not kept up, and these wealthy Arab people living in the, in the region complained. So Denver hired this undertaker to dig up all the bodies, reposition them in different places around the city, and uh, move on from there. Unfortunately, the undertaker didn't quite do his job. Now, there's nothing wrong with an area being repurposed from a cemetery into a beautiful city park. In fact, the history of humanity shows that's in fact what's happened over thousands of years. People have lived on top of grave sites and so forth. What's intriguing here is that how few people realize this was indeed a cemetery, and frankly, that you can actually see the outlines of the graves from above. During spring and summer, you can see the outlines of the graves as the grass grows up through more fertile, dense areas from the graves below. Menorca, a tiny island in the western Mediterranean, it's filled with ancient stone ruins. We'll be examining some of the more bizarre, strange, unusual, and gigantic stone ruins, getting drone shots of them, and trying to come up with an idea as to what in the world were they doing with these structures. Stay tuned, Sal Trento, Mysterious Places on Menorca. A number of years ago, I spent about seven years excavating this one of the most unusual sites in the world. It's called a taula which in Spanish means a table. About two to 3,000 years ago, the people on this island built these massive taliots. That's that large stone, it's called a watchtower. And right next to it is this T-shaped structure.
With a team of several dozen archaeologists, we spent seven seasons excavating this very peculiar structure. As you can see, there's an entranceway and there's a soil mark. We pulled out all the stones and debris and found some rather incredulous stuff. This was a sanctuary, an ancient sanctuary where they burned lots of fire, they sacrificed goats. In fact, at the base of this large stone tee, we found many, many, many feet of soil filled with goats, goat bones, particularly the knuckles of goat bones. The talas were sanctuaries where people would come, they would light their fires, they would pray, and perhaps they also worship the bull god. As at all mysterious sites, the issue is why here? Why have they placed this very large, very incredible structure at this particular site? Well, years ago, I didn't have the technology, but now, 25 years later, I do. And I spent the last several uh, days, actually, ex uh, measuring the geomagnetic fields in this area and found that the Taula, this large stone tee behind me, resides on a very special power place, a place where the magnetic fields are very unusual. Now, it's not that they had these instruments back three, 4,000 years ago, but they probably felt differently at the site. When the magnetic field is anomalous or different, one actually starts feeling a little bit strange. It affects your pineal gland at the base of your thalamus. A number of years ago, I realized that the orientation or which way these towels face is positioned towards the rising full moon. On the last day of our excavation, we were packing up, and on that day, a little boy came by, his name was Juan, and he said, have you seen the well or the now de na patata? I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. So the little boy just took me on a little walk over this uh, little fence here, this stone fence, to a standing stone that you can see in the distance there. Just beyond that little standing stone, above that stone fence in the bushes, is one of the most incredible structures I've ever seen. It's called the Well or Naul de Napatata. Napatata is the property location, the family's name. And beyond that fence is a hole that drops down 155 feet, of which the interior has a carved stairwell. I climbed down it and essentially had a mystical experience. It was absolutely strange. Again, this was during a hot July day, and I climbed down there took some great photos, of which you can see in the next few sequences, and we really don't know why they did it this way. Now, there are wells all over the island, but not nothing as large as this one. This was a very special one. This is Calas Covas, Cove of the Caves in Southern Menorca. It has been a place for both to travel to and take sanctuary for thousands of years. Behind me are hundreds of caves, of which some of them have inscriptions. Now this is an intriguing Tala. This Tala was covered up by people sometime in the past, not the ancient ones, whereby they filled in the pillars around the Tala with dry stone, enclosing it. This is one of the earliest towers on the island. Uh, it's rather crudely built. Uh, it is, again, part of a massive complex. These towers were part of a huge complex of ancient villages. It was a center ritual site. These structures represent some mysterious deity. They would burn fires in front of the Taula, uh, goats, sheep, and they would sacrifice them. We've seen butcher marks on some of the bones. But what exactly they were praying to is not really known. At another site called Teralba, we found uh, an ancient bull god, a bronze bull. We found evidence of Emotek, who was a healer from Egypt at one of these sites. So uh, they seem to have been remnants of where people would come and pray and worship and sacrifice animals. 
looking for something. But what exactly were they worshipping? Now the question of placement, why in the world did they put these towers, these table rocks, where they are? Now these table rocks were built around maybe 900 BC, almost 3,000 years ago, and they were built in a location where there already were people here, prehistoric people that built other structures. So whoever came in here built these structures in particular spots. I've done some measurements around this particular one. In fact, I've done measurements at every tower site that we visited, and I find that at the base of the tower, there's one set of geomagnetic field. When you go outside the complex into the general vicinity, as you can see, there's a, a completely different type of geomagnetic field. It's too close for, for chance to be there. And I find that the area over here, beyond where you see that wall, and the area behind this, over there, by, uh, beyond these rocks, are pretty much the same. What's different is right here within this ceremonial complex. That's why, that's where the actual magnetic fields get what's called the barren. Unusual, strange, different. My suspicion is that they were placed here because of that pattern. And probably the ancient shamans or whoever decided to build these structures felt differently here. Because they could have put this towel aside anywhere, anywhere in this field. If you look up here, there is what's called a taliot, a watchtower. That structure of stones that you see is much older than this sanctuary site. So the people that built this taula came into this area, saw this large, again called taliot, which means watchtower, and decided to put it right over here. It's the same pattern that we found in the other side so far in this video. The people that built these Tau these taulas chose these locations with a very specific objective in mind. This is the Taliot site, or watchtower. We're gonna climb to the top, get a good view. This is the top of the watchtower, the Taliot. And as you can see, it has a spectacular view of the island. These people knew what they were doing in terms of location. <laughs> location, location, location. I've had the good fortune of actually excavating a few of these sites. But even with the excavation, seven, eight years worth, we still have very little to go on as to what exactly was happening. So we're faced with a problem. The problem is, what are these structures? Well, they're part of a large complex of people living here. What's amazing is that there are so many of these, again, 33 and 34 talisites, and lots of other ruins and taliots and so forth. This place was teeming with people. They all loved living here, apparently, and the population was massive. And the question is, why? What was so special about living in Menorca? Yes, it is beautiful. It's absolutely spectacular, but probably has something to do with the flatness of the island, the orientation of these structures, which way they faced, part of their religious worship, and they probably had a very good fertile soil in which to grow stuff, wheat, barley, definitely were doing that, and to shepherd different uh, uh, animals like sheep and goats, which clearly were brought in from elsewhere in the Mediterranean. So this was, probably a pretty good place to live. Unfortunately, a bit later, the Romans came in, took over, and Romanized the entire uh, structures. You'd find a lot of their pottery at some of the Taula sites, the sanctuary sites, and some of the large watchtower sites. And later on, you start seeing a bunch of other types of cultures coming in, sweeping through the island, getting rid of people, and so forth. Now, what's intriguing is that the Romans, who came here during the latter part, or the so the end of the Taliotic culture, they hired the young men as mercenaries to fight some of the wars against the Carthaginians, or the, the so-called Punic Wars. What was interesting is that the people that lived on this island had a very unique way of fighting. They used slings. In fact, they were the ancient slingers from, uh, in biblical terms, you actually read about these people they would be forced to knock down a piece of bread that was in the crook of a, of a tree. And if they didn't do that, they wouldn't eat. So it was sort of like tough love. Learned how to do this from a very young age. These people apparently were brilliant in terms of slinging. They would be able to hit anything, any place, any time with the length of the sling. And they were hired out by the Romans. Now, they never accepted 
gold or silver for payment. That wasn't their thing, and that's why you never find any gold or silver in any of these structures or their burial sites and so forth. What they demanded payment, now we know this from the early uh, Greek and Roman writers who talked about this, this very odd behavior. They would uh, prefer to have wine and women. That was their payment, <laughs> wine and women. This is a beautifully constructed tower. You can see very clearly the form and the pattern. Now this one has a column next to it that leans over. And we don't think that was originally the case, the way it was designed. It probably was put up somewhere else and maybe sometime in the last uh, thousand years or so, maybe the Arabs who conquered this island came by and just positioned it in that way. But this is an anomaly having that little column on the side. But this structure is incredibly designed in terms of the carving ability of these people. Now remember, this is over 4,000 years of acid rain. Yes, even back then, decomposing some limestone, but yet you can still see the squareness, the edges, the care that it took to make this thing. And this again is part of a horseshoe shaped enclosure that is typical of all Taula sites, whatever this shape meant to the ancients. Over the years, people have asked me, why are you so fixated on stones? In fact, on this uh, very recent trip, people have seen me videotaping and uh, measuring and so forth and saying, what's going on here? Well, I'm not fixated on the stones, I'm fixated on what they mean and why they were placed where they were. I mean, clearly it took a lot of effort, a lot of uh, uh, power to move these blo giant blocks of stone, some of the way up to 40 tons. They were deeply motivated to do something, so I'm interested in the motivation. But also with these Taulacites, what were they worshipping? What was so special about this island to put up these slabs of stone? Majorca, the larger island, is uh, nearby, uh, a day's sail away, and yet you don't find any of these Taulas, these flat table rocks there. You find these Talias, these watchtowers, but nowhere do you find any of these Talas. This island seemed to be relegated to a very special place in that early culture that we call the Taliotic. You can move rocks if you're motivated enough, if you have enough spirituality behind you or enough uh, oxen or horses or whatever, uh, you can move them. But why? Why bother? What's going on here? What's the deeper meaning behind these things? What was this culture doing? And in fact, Menorca was really an outlier. It was well, it was outside the regular traffic work of the Phoenicians and Romans. Later on, it became part of the pathway for Mediterranean traffic. But in the early days, people got here from where they came from and lived their life of solitude, essentially. And, but they had these strange rituals going on. And my interest has to do with what were they working on? What was the desire behind these people? What was the common factor? What, what social network brought them together to do whatever they did? Now we have a lot of anecdotes from the Greek and Roman writers. Some of them may be true, some of them may not. And uh, if you take them from face value, uh, they were, these people were a pretty weird lot in terms of what they were doing. For example, uh, one of the uh, early Greek Roman writers mentioned that when someone got married on this island, they, um, Part of the, the, the prenuptial ceremony would be to have the, uh, the bridegroom, the man, have all of his relatives, again, this comes from the writings, sleep with the future bride prior to getting married. Now, is that true? Is that just uh, an exaggeration? Don't know, but that's what they all talk about. Actually, not just one writer, but many of them talk about this very peculiar custom. Now, the Romans were not uh, Puritans. <laughs> <laughs> there were no slouches when it came to deviant sexual behavior. So, but yet this type of behavior caught their attention and they wrote about it, which may give credence to the story. These people were living in isolation for many, many, many years. Um, and they built up a culture that I find strange, odd, because there's no way to explain what they did. Now, even in the excavations that we've done, we find just the remnants of sacrifice, remnants of offerings and so on. We don't know the language that they spoke. We don't know the complex ceremonies that clearly had to be involved in something of this nature. We have no idea. So my interest has to do with that stuff. It's the anthropological point of view. What drove these people and what kind of customs and rituals?
off to an island ruin, a place where the ancient Maya would come to search for fertility. Women would come from all over the area to pray and to give offerings to this one particular site about 20 miles off the coast of the main Yucatan Peninsula. They would come here to look for a way to give birth. I took a side journey to Cozumel to take a look at this particular site. Now Cozumel has gotten a bad rap over the years. Yes, there are hotels and trinket shops and all sorts of other weird things that 21st century tourists buy on the, uh, the southern tip where a lot of cruise ships uh, dock. But about 85% of the island is jungle. And about, frankly, 80, 75 to 80% of it still has ruins that haven't been touched yet. So we're here in the middle of the island looking at some of these ruins. There's a certain commonality to Mayan architecture. Once you see one ruin, essentially you see them all, but it's the placement that's most intriguing. Now a lot of the larger ones on the uh, peninsula of, Tolu of uh, the Yucatan were placed above uh, water sources, as this particular spot in Cozumel probably was as well, but why this particular spot? The entire island is limestone, which means there's a lot of water below uh, the ground, as it were. But again, uh, this is a perennial problem as to why particular spots were chosen by ancient civilizations to build their temples. Over the years, I've discovered that many sacred sites scattered throughout the world are located at ground places that have unusual magnetic fields coming from deep within the earth. Armed with a very sophisticated device called a Gaussian magnetometer, I've surveyed the natural and geomagnetic fields of hundreds of these prehistoric sites. But as I would approach a special temple, the magnetic field radically changed, revealing an astonishing pattern. Ancient people chose specific locations for their sacred buildings. The sites were built on top of wildly fluctuating magnetic fields. Laboratory research over the past decade has shown that changing electromagnetic fields can influence different brain chemicals like serotonin or melatonin that can be increased or decreased depending on the flux of the magnetic field. One's mood and general perception of the world can be altered. Turns out, this can also happen in the field near a sacred site. Prehistoric shamans selected a particular location because it made them feel differently, perhaps by enhancing their perceived communication with the spirit world. The stone temple at Cozumel was built on top of an aberrant magnetic field, something that naturally occurs only at this particular location on the island. People were drawn to this place to commune with Ishel, the goddess of fertility and healing. The same phenomena occurs on the island of Puerto Rico. On the northwestern coast is a remarkable sea cave. Stepping down into this naturally carved chamber, one sees hundreds of faces carved into the ancient limestone. Some are open mouth, others have deeply recessed eyes, and others looked like little babies. The effect is overwhelming. Faces stare out from every corner of the enclosure. The indigenous islanders known as Taino would come to this cave to give birth. Taino descendants said the faces are the spirits of babies, many who died during childbirth. This site was both the entranceway to the physical world as well as the doorway to the next. The magnetic fields at this site are dramatically different from the surrounding locale. In fact, the numbers are so high that women who labored here experienced an altered reality. Several miles south is another fertility site. In the center of a circle of upright stones, many painted with birthing images, are some of the most violently changing magnetic fields yet measured. The actual ceremonies that took place here are unknown but vestiges of those ghostly rituals linger. The pathways, gathering places, ceremonial standing stones continue to capture the hearts of modern women, like those using the site as a special place to practice their ancient craft, the brujas, the witches today, who are still in tune with the old ways.
on the side of a mountain in southern New York State are hundreds of stone piles. They're located a few feet from an ancient Native American trail and a few miles from an even older trail that goes over the southern mountains. For years people have been coming by to look at these things and wondering what are they? Well I'll tell you what they are today. Some of these structures are very nicely built. Others are in various states of disrepair. But these stone piles have a certain regularity to them. They're always built on base boulders. The rocks slant inwards. They're located on the eastern slope of hillsides and there's always a water source nearby. The novice looking at these stone piles would simply say, well, they're field clearance. Uh, this is not farm territory, this is not farmland. And there's no evidence of any kind of agriculture right around this region. They're placement holders. They're recognizing something very special. And the first settlers talked about them. They wrote about these things. In fact, many of them used some of these stones as foundation uh, stones for their homes. A nice source of rock, actually. Stone piles are found all around the world. They're also called cairns, C-A-R-N-S, cairns. And uh, every culture apparently had these things. Again, when the first settlers got to this shore, American shore, they, this was the most noticeable thing on the East Coast, these piles of rock. And they didn't know what to think. There was lots of speculation. Well, my team uh, got together a number of years ago and excavated one of these stone piles and found some rather extraordinary things. For the most part, the builders of these stone piles used an angular method, that is the stones, flat slabs, face inwards, and the progressing weight on top of each stone essentially kept the whole thing together. And a flat base stone was there to keep everything level and not sink into the c continuing moist soil that uh, in this area uh, you get lots of pit depressions because of uh, old trees and the, the spongy nature of the soil, as it were. Many times next to a stone pile you find an elliptical-shaped mound of earth. In fact, that's rather common. So we're left with the question, what are these things? It turns out they're burial markers. Below the large slab of stone, the base rock, are skeletons. People were buried here. This was a site where people would come, apparently, on this old Native American trail to visit, perhaps, their loved ones and to bury recently deceased. Now, this particular spot has been here for, we think, at least close to a thousand years. Now, some of these things have been repaired, clearly, you can see that, but many of them are in disrepair. Now, how do I know this? A few years ago, we excavated, we removed the soil on one of these elliptical shaped mounds of earth and found something rather startling. It's important to understand that this is a sacred spot. This is a place where lots of people came to bury their dead. They mourned their dead. They cried. They laughed. They thought back to the spirit of the person. But in this one area, it's a cemetery, essentially. It's one of the few areas uh, where we know lots of Native Americans uh, were put to rest in the ground but also a place that is somewhat permanent with markers. And there are these structures, these stone piles all across the East Coast. You don't find them that much west of the Mississippi, but all in the eastern quadrant of this, of this country you find these. Again, this is in New York State, southern New York State, about two hours north of New York City, a few hours uh, west of the Hudson, uh, an hour or so east of the Delaware River, right in the, in the, the middle area. Now, people fail to forget or fail to remember that this area was populated with lots and lots of people. When we look at our current uh, society with uh, dollar stores and uh, Kohl's and Walmarts and so forth and asphalt, it's hard to, 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 to understand that people were living here off the land. Now, this is an extraordinarily fertile area to live in. There's a, a swamp nearby called the Basha Kill. 
and it's an area that was populated and still is populated with lots of fowl, lots of fish and so forth. Very easy pickings as it were if you know what you're doing. Lots of plants in the, in the region to forage uh, material for. But there were hundreds of people living here, so these people had to get rid of their dead. And this is one of the techniques that they utilized to uh, bury their dead, but also remember their dead. This is Sal Trento, signing off from the mysterious stone pile site in southern New York State. Until next time, take care. So if you wander around the fields, wherever you are, and you come across lots of stone piles, Remember, they're probably not field clearance, particularly if they're on the eastern slope of mountains, uh, on a base stone, near a source of water. They're probably some type of burial marker. Point Conception was named by one of the early Spanish explorers uh, for the Immaculate Conception, and over time it changed it to simply uh, Conception, Concepcion. But in any event, why this particular spot that the Pumash worship? Like a lot of things about this particular tribe of people, we don't really know, we don't really understand what was so special about this place. I mean, the beauty is staggering when you're actually at the point, per se. Um, violent crashing waves and so forth, but why this particular spot? Again, it's hard to say what was going on in the mind of these people, but visually it is exciting and perhaps this was the nature of these people to simply be in an area where the spirits would wander into paradise. This is a little bit north of Point Conception, where the Kumash would claim that their spirits would come here and go west into the uh, paradise. Uh, this is a very special place. Thousands of people would come here. But this is the extreme western part of Santa Barbara County. And as you can see in the, the opening uh, video drone shots, Point Conception is a tiny little peak. Now you can't get there these days. It's owned by the Coast Guard and it's a private land. And the only way to get there is to uh, navigate in the boat and then climb up the, uh, the sand, which I didn't have time to do that, uh, this particular jaunt. But in any event, this is a little bit north of Point Conception. And the Kumush would come here, both physically and spiritually, and wait for their deaths. In fact, shamans would be with them to help them transition into the next world. Point Conception. There's a lighthouse that was built in the 1840s or 50s uh, on Point Conception. And the builders who were excavating for the foundation of the lighthouse found a whole series of uh, artifacts. They said that their ancestor told them, the family history, that the place was loaded with evidence of uh, time past. For those of you who have been fortunate enough to live near a beach in your youth, you can almost understand the serenity and beauty of the surf crashing into the sand. There is a regularity to it. So-called negative ions are being cascaded uh, to people on the shore. It's a peaceful type of place to hang out. It's a place I highly recommend for anyone who's inland to take a trip and just hang out on the beach. You don't have to do anything. Just walk along the beach and see what's actually there. The ocean will be 
mesmerizing and probably put you to sleep. This is Sal Trento from Mysterious Places at Point Conception, a tiny place west of Santa Barbara, the westerly part of the Kumash domain where spirit, the souls of people that died would go off into paradise. There's a stone sphere behind me stuck in a 150 million year old rock. And for years, people were wondering what the heck is this thing? It was first found when they made this rock cut back in the 1930s to connect uh, two pathways into Denver. And they exposed this rock and they found this round thing. And for years, people have been wondering what the heck is this thing? The most common expression is that it's called a concretion. Sort of like uh, when an oyster has like lots of uh, calcium deposits on top of a piece of sand. That's what they think this thing is. I'm not too sure about that. If you look closely, you'll see the sphere, and then you drop down about another 50 million years to around 200 million years ago, and you see this little round concave area. There was another round object there, and I actually tracked down where this particular uh, round stone is. Uh, I write about it in one of my books. So, where's the mystery? How often do you find a round object instead of a rock cut that's 150 million years old? What do I think this is? I don't think it's a concretion. I think this was probably some type of a round bolide or asteroid that made its way into the uh, muck and mud in this region before volcanic ash can cover the whole thing up and buried it for us to see. The only way we'll be able to figure out what this is is to drill a core into it and then compare it to the surrounding sides, which is not gonna happen. People just don't like doing that within the area. Now, scientists, we'd love to do that, but when you're dealing with large bureaucracies, it ain't gonna happen. High above Berkeley, California, is a series of mountain ridges that extend for miles. On the very top of this mountain ridge are a series of walls that go on for up to 50 miles, both north and south of this particular spot. As to who built them, no one has a clue. What at first seems like a series of field walls turns out to be not the case. The first Spaniards who got into this area found these stones in place. Some of the landowners put up fences that parallel the walls. The walls are heavily eroded. There's lots of debris, trees growing up out of them. But if you look closely, you'll see the pattern. This is at the very top of the ridge. Some of the boulders weigh up to 20 tons and they're made of basalt, a type of very dense volcanic stone, but they continue onwards. Many times, many parts of this particular spot, uh, they're covered over by lots of grass and leaves and so forth, so you can hardly see what's there. There are many parts of the United States where there are stone ruins, and what's real interesting is when you go back through the archives of the first settlers got into an area, or in the diary records uh, on the East Coast, Midwest, all the way out to the Pacific Coast, which is where we are right now. And you interview, you look at some of the writings of the early people that got here, and they comment on different ruins. They comment on these stone walls being in place. And that's the problem. We don't know who built them. There are many candidates. Uh, it's possible that these were some type of uh, ley line that is pointing due north, which they in fact do. They stretch due north all the way up past the water, past the bay, into a place called Marin County. That's right beyond the Golden Gate Bridge. 
These walls go on for, again, as I said, 50 to 60 miles south of here, and they go up probably about another 20 to 30 miles north across the bay. And that's quite remarkable. There's a tremendous amount of labor that went into these stones, and the question is, who built them? But perhaps more importantly, why? If you look closely, mysterious details are evident. There are no metal tool marks anywhere on these basalt boulders. Whoever quarried the blocks did so by prying out giant slabs from base rock without drills, levers, and the like. The stones have all the hallmarks of fire quarrying. Over the years, there have been rampant speculation about the wall builders and their motives. Candidates range from a lost tribe to extraterrestrial visitors. <laughs> a San Francisco Chronicle reporter in 1904 asked, Who built the prehistoric walls topping the Berkeley Hills? Do the miles of mysterious stone barriers, which serve no modern purpose, bespeak a lost civilization of Toltecs or Atlanteans? Now, the fact that the walls were a complete mystery in the early 1900s, some 50 years after the gold rush rocketed San Francisco into modern consciousness, is astonishing. The walls may have been a tangible marker for those in search of a vision quest. So exactly who were these builders? Unfortunately, we don't know. But it is clear that they were delving into and attempting to control an ancient and powerful natural force. On the very tip of the town of Montecito, not far from Santa Barbara, on prime real estate overlooking the ocean, is a Kumash burial site. Surrounded by extraordinarily expensive homes, this plot of land is the burial site of many, many Native Americans, of which there was a village not far from this particular site. This is the sacred circle, or maze as it were, at the Kumash burial site. Apparently people would come here and then follow the pathway around these stones to reach a higher level of under spiritual understanding. The Kumash were a thriving Native American uh, community that lived on the coast of California. They traveled into the ocean here and they went to the Channel Islands to fish. Everything was great for, we think, nine to 10,000 years until the Spanish arrived. Uh, within a very short amount of time when they arrived in the now called Santa Barbara area, uh, most of the Native Americans had died of disease. Many of them were uh, taken into slavery to help build the, the Santa Barbara mission. In other words, their entire culture collapsed. If anyone got screwed by this, uh, by European incursion, it was the Kumash. This is a blissful area to live in, and has been for thousands of years. In fact, this area is one of the few remaining beach locations where people uh, have access to the beach, their own private beach. It's something that we need to, uh, the people in the area need to be aware of and cognizant. It's funny, as I was traveling along the beach pathway to get to this site, I came across many people who have lived in the Santa, Monica, Santa Barbara area for years. 
and I asked for directions. I had no idea what I was talking to, talking about. Anyway, I finally found that some of these people came by and said, oh, that's what you meant. I always wondered what this large field was. Now, that's astonishing. This has been here for generations, this burial site. I'm not quite sure of how many people are buried here, but considering the size of it, probably a significant number. Again, this is Sal Trento, Mysterious Places, signing off. This is Salmon Creek, north of Bodega Bay, where hundreds of Native Americans lived thousands of years ago. Right over there. The Salmon Creek is north of Bodega, the town of Bodega, which we'll go take a look at real soon. That's the site where in the 1960s, Alfred Hitchcock shot a famous movie called The Birds. The mystery of the site is that very few remnants of the people that lived here still exist. However, modern people who have homes along the estuary here, along the, the creek, occasionally have picked up mortars, pestles, other types of implements done by, made by the Native Americans in the region. And that's the only indication that people actually lived here. One kind of wonder is what's going to be here after the first earthquake hits this region and decimates most of the homes within the area will be as mysterious as the people who once lived right over there. Salmon Creek flows into the Pacific. Let's get past our 21st century perspective. Why would people live on a creek near an ocean? Well, there's a lot of food there. There's lots of uh, fowl, there's lots of fish, lots of seashells, and then you have the ocean where there's gigantic diff different types of fish, large fish they would canoe out into the ocean and capture some wonderful, wonderful food stuff. So this is a, a bountiful region once you understand the resources that are here. But yet today there's nothing there, nothing at all, just the remnants. Perhaps you find a, uh, as I said, a pestle or a mortar, or maybe you even find uh, some arrowheads or spear points, and that's about it. There's no foundation stones, nothing of the sort, of course. They didn't do that. And that's what's kind of curious. That is, they lived here for such a long time, apparently, uh, unnoticed by other tribes, and they had a relatively good life here. The living was easy in California. In fact, it was the ancient California dream. So by having perspective of the ancients, we can learn a lot from them. We can learn how they survived. We can learn what they did. And with respect to our culture, Unfortunately, uh, given the materials that we build with, given the recyclability of the materials that we have since at least the 1970s, there won't be much for people to look at in the future. So we really need to, to take stock of what we have, enjoy it, but also recognize that there were people living here a very, very long time ago who were extraordinarily successful in their environs. What's intriguing is that every year, these people trekked out about 16 miles south of here to a place called Two Rocks. Two Rocks is basically a large set of two rocks set up on top of a hill. Natural, natural glacial erratics as they're called. But they would trek 60 miles south, find that pathway and go right through the center and walk into the Sierra Mountains. Long trek, but it's something they did every year. There's suspicion that there was also a vision quest involved here, where they would go seeking for some type of higher spirituality. Quite mysterious, the mysterious trek.
There's a spot in northern Colorado called Turtle Rock because it looks like a large turtle. It's called the geoform. And it was caused by glaciers that moved through and just deformed the rock. But what's intriguing are the things around this particular geomorph. This is a stone boulder that has some type of stones at the bottom of it. And on top is what looks like a libation bowl. Somebody carved this, cut this V-shaped entity so that liquid would pour through, perhaps water, perhaps something else. I'm in an area of extreme glacial erratics. Those are rocks that were left by the glaciers a long time ago. And we're gonna be taking a look at some of the peculiar forms out in this particular spot. It's uh, Northwest uh, Colorado, the Northern part of the Rocky Mountains. They look like they've been carved by people, not by the wind, not by water, by someone who looked at this place and for reasons that we know not, thought it was very interesting and necessary to carve rocks, perhaps to look at the setting sun, perhaps to look on the horizon. In 1850, a team of about 105 people left Georgia on their way to California, the California gold mines. Gold had just been discovered the year before, and this particular bunch of people wanted to make their fortune. They trekked across the Cherokee Trail of Tears, stopped off at a place called Clear Creek, bunkered down for a few hours, and one of the people, this guy by the name of Ralston, took his pan, stuck it in the water, and found gold. Ralston knew what he was doing. He was a gold miner. So after finding about a quarter of an ounce of gold, why didn't they just stop and continue digging right over here? Well, it comes down to publicity and PR. California was the place to be. California was where everything was happening. It was where people were making absolutely outrageous fortunes. And news got back east, and people just wanted to continue trekking across the Rocky Mountains, which is not an easy trek, by the way and they wanted to continue to the gold fields, as it were. They found that this type of uh, mining was, or this type of looking for what's called placer gold from stream beds was not to their liking. They wanted something bigger, much more magnificent. So the next day they packed up their horses and they went over the Rockies to California. So, is all the gold extracted from this uh, little creek area? Absolutely not. In fact, later in this uh, episode, I'll be going up to a place called Idaho Springs, which the next major gold find uh, was made. And I will be doing a little bit of uh, placer hunting. But after the uh, spring thaw, when the Rocky Mountains release all of the snow melt, you have this incredible rush of stream, including Clear Creek, which is right here, and it erodes away the banks of the river, and anything that's in the water, anything that's left there, will come out. Nine years later, a guy by the name of George Jackson, who uh, spent some time in the California gold mines, went to Colorado. He had heard a little bit about the gold that was found in Colorado at, at Ralston Creek. Nothing serious, according to him. But he came out to Colorado to go, uh, join a hunting trip with a, a few of his buddies. So they came up to this region about, uh, oh, about maybe 20 miles north of where we just were, trekked along this clear creek, looked at the terrain, looked at the gravel deposits, and then came across this one little 
stream. Now Jackson was a uh, frontier prospector. He knew a lot about finding gold. So he saw this little tributary over here leading into Clear Creek and he saw this gravel deposit exactly the conditions that he found gold in California. Now the reason Jackson started looking at the uh, gravel deposits is because gold is very dense, it's very heavy. So anytime you have a chunk of gold, a nugget as it were, uh, that starts to, that's coming down from the mountains or from the stream beds, uh, it gets deposited in areas just like this. So the guys hunkers down, it's winter by the way, it's January 1859. He hunkers down on the side, gets his pan out, and starts panning for gold when this was all ice. <laughs> the guy had to go through lots of ice and cold and so forth. Now, this is snow melt, quick so it's really, really, really cold. So the guy pokes around for about half an hour, and he finds the largest, what's called placer, or a chunk of gold ever found in anywhere in Colorado. Until next time, Sal Trento with Mysterious Places.